Welcome to the Echo Cast, a podcast about video game news, speculation, rumors, and reviews. I am your host, Morgan, aka Bon Diesel, and this week I'll be covering The Division 2 Banning Exploiters, Red Dead Redemption's Possible Remake, EAFC's first non FIFA release, and much more. A few things before we get started subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast platform and on YouTube, please subscribe to the channel, hit the like button, and comment with your thoughts, questions for next week, or to just say hello. A special thank you to all of my patrons, including producer-level patrons, Hassan and Horseman, supporter-level patrons, PK, The Dawn, Cage Nephilim, and Neuronex, as well as viewer-level patron, Zenra. If you're interested in supporting this podcast and getting ad-free episodes for as little as $1 a month, please check out patreon.com slash bonddiesel. Okay, let's get into the gaming news. This week we have eight topics. The first one being the headline, The Division 2 Hands Out Bans to Exploiters. So this has been an interesting story because... The actual story slash the action that Ubisoft Massive, who's the developer of The Division uh, 1 and 2, um, the the action they took isn't like that weird or surprising. Uh, Long story short, they implemented a new mode into the game. People figured out how to exploit it, uh, exploit a bug that would allow them to level up really quickly. Those levels do impact uh the the plane of the game uh specifically the pvp and they had warned people during previous bugs and exploits that in the future this wouldn't be treated with you know you know kid gloves and that they were going to punish people and that's what they're doing so uh what they're doing is uh handing out temporary uh suspensions up to bans on people uh, and this has led to a bunch of interesting reactions I think um, the expected reactions were from like the community, including creators. The reactions that were really interesting, though, to me was uh, from like uh, journalists and pundits and stuff like that, because I am not aware of any journalist and, you know, the, the, those, you know, that tier of uh, media personality who plays the Division two consistently. The only people I ever hear talk about it is like Greg Miller from Kind of Funny, and he is more just like kind, kindly, uh, you know, reflecting on how much he loves the division. But he doesn't play it anymore, and he hasn't probably in years. Uh, I, I think he did play Warlords of New York, and I believe he liked it. But he's literally basically the only um, person I hear even mention it uh, often when it comes to various podcast and uh you know the, those you know, articles and journal uh, journalists uh you know reviews and things like that and um some a, a journalist got into an interesting situation where uh, and I'm, i'll call out tom warren being the main one who they kind of tried to throw out like a hot take uh and then just looked really dumb and instead of just like being like, ah, okay, I probably put my foot in my mouth a little bit. You know, I, I may not know as much of the, about this as I wish I did. Uh, you know, he kind of just um, silenced everyone. <laughs> and so what happened was Tom Warren, um, you know, commented and I think quote tweeted uh, the announcement about these um, about these bands and 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 such. And he um, he's like, you know, you know, uh, punishing players because your team uh, can't fix bugs quick enough. Uh, is why no one plays this game anymore. And like, look, the Division Two isn't Destiny Two, uh, but I bet it's and 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 it, it probably isn't Warframe either. Even though even fewer people talk about Division uh, or Warframe than the Division Two, at least in my circles. Um, but it's you know I, you know most of the people in the community are cool with these bands and stuff because. Uh, you know, people knew that you shouldn't be doing this and they still did it. And his take was still basically like, 
you well the, it was the, it's the developer's fault not you shouldn't punish players that's why no one plays the game it's like dude come on like you don't have any idea who plays this game anymore like you obviously aren't in touch with that community or that set of people and and that's fine but it got to the point where it was very obvious he and some other commentators were like speaking out their butt and had no idea what they were talking about. And they and I'm sure he just thought he could pass off some hot take about this and that a bunch of people would agree with him because no one plays the game. Uh, and that's not how it worked. He ended up blocking the tweet uh, so that only people he followed could respond to it and um, and never really uh, even gave a little like uh, you know, he didn't relent at all he just he just went hard uh was pretty obviously speaking out of his booty hole and um you know that's just how that went and that's fine it's it doesn't matter at the end of the day he um uh you know he'll he'll move on and um to me it's just what annoyed me about it is that uh it, i can pretty much guarantee this dude's played like maybe like two afternoons of division and felt like he was had some, you know, some, some place to talk about it. Right. So now the community reaction, which included clapping back at this guy, um, for the most part, you know, um, there's always going to be people who, you know, will do the whole, like, well, you know, they should just fix their issues and not punish people. Um, but that leaves out the context of, you know, that these things have happened before and maybe that's its own complaint. Um, and, and they, they've made it really clear that, you know, if you're if you're purposefully exploiting the game now, you know, sure. You know, if, if, if it's obvious that the stuff happened and you didn't mean to do it and that you weren't like grinding it all day, every day to abuse it, I suspect, you know, those people didn't get, uh, you know, banned or even suspended. Um, but, you know, uh, the, the really interesting part of this has been the creator side of things. And you've seen a lot of the creators who I think are maybe on the more honest side of things and uh, and, and such kind of recognize that yeah like this is what they should do they should show they take you know cheats and exploits and all of that seriously and they should you know do what they said they were going to do and, and that's what they've done now obviously there is a, a subset of uh the the creators and so on and so forth that uh you know disagreed and 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 um you will find that this is probably a lot of the people who are making videos non-stop showing people how to exploit the game and use these exploits uh and, and unfortunately as far as i know not everyone who did that has actually had their accounts banned another could be various reasons for that uh they may have so many accounts that you know maybe they only did the exploit on a couple of the accounts and you know I, i'm sure massive could get creative to figure out um you know that i was imagine this would be a person ban not a single account ban uh but maybe you know some people have so many accounts over different platforms it would be hard to track all those down um it, it it's interesting uh there's one creator in particular who um, I have, you know, you know, had blocked and, and have very purposefully ignored for a really long time, uh, I believe, because a long time ago they were promoting like, hey, if you have an NDA about division stuff, you can tell me and I'll spread the information, uh, which is like Bush League, like really like like real BS, like real pathetic stuff. And um, uh, and since then, this individual has, you know, been caught multiple times, like stealing people's like screenshots and stuff to use in their thumbnails without permission. And, uh, and is in general, just kind of a bad take, you know, awful, toxic, uh, spewing machine. Uh, but, uh, and I believe they're even on, uh, or at least at one point we're in the PVP, uh, elite task force, which is this group of players that a massive, uh, brings in or works closely with to try to improve the game. And so unfortunately massive has a bad history of, uh, allowing people onto this elite task force who are some of the absolute worst actors in the community, uh, and, and have done nothing but spread toxicity and, and awfulness. But off of that, uh, obvious, uh, bandwagon or, uh, or, or whatever, uh, you know, complain train, um, some of the creators are quite upset about this. And, uh, I will say it's pretty much reserved to the type of creators who, uh, make most of their content uh, about, you know, sensationalized things or straight up lies about the game and speculation that is just clearly not true, but it gets clicks. Uh, and, um, you know, 
I would say if you see someone going hard, def, you know, going against these bands and this action, uh, you're you're probably dealing with a certain kind of creator. And if that's what you enjoy, cool, good for you. I don't know why you're here. There's no way you enjoy me. But uh, it, it's just it's been an interesting week in the division community. Um, I think the most frustrating for me was was kind of the journalists and stuff who felt like they had like a hot take to give, even though they have just zero idea about the context and the sentiment in the community and things like that. But, you know, here we are. Next, uh, next story is about Escape from Tarkov. Uh, they released a technical update through 13.1. So this was uh, upcoming. Uh, people were anticipating this for a while. Tarkov is a weird game. Um, it's been in development for a long time. It's been in beta the entire time. I, I would describe it as almost like Star Citizen with more results. Uh, maybe the scope isn't quite that big, uh, but it's had a similar issue where their developer and especially the, the kind of head of the studio um, basically just can't seem to keep like feature creep and in, in check and stuff. And he just kind of seems like he'll never be fully satisfied uh, with putting more stuff in the game, uh, but never seems they just never seem to like fully finish anything they've already put in the game. So Tarkov is an interesting game. If you don't know what it is, it's a it's a it's, it's what you would basically describe as like an extraction shooter. It has a lot of like RPG elements to it. Uh, it, it it's aesthetic is a like hyper realistic, very immersive shooter um, and that, you know, you have to, you know, tourniquet your heavy bleeds and you have to bandage light bleeds and you have to repair broken limbs you have to you know stay hydrated and fed you do all of these missions that you're assigned by various uh, mission givers and uh, you you know you find good loot or you kill people and take their loot and you have to find an extract uh and it's this big you know experience and it is a very it's a it's a unique game it's uh, the reason people keep going back to it even though it's a complete uh you know know <laughs> crap show uh in a lot of ways is because um while there's other extraction shooters and there's a bunch of those coming none of them have the same like feel or aesthetic as tarkov um it's just a unique it's a unique situation um and and i love it even though i hate it too it's a you'll find that uh, a lot of tarkov players will say that now the big thing about tarkov is that every now and then about every six months they do a wipe and that's where they install some really big patch big update to the game with new maps and new gear and a bunch of new stuff and um they typically they typically wipe the game which means that all of your leveling all of your gear all of your money all of the missions that you've completed everything you've done is wiped and you start a brand new character uh, and they do this because they want to kind of test you know early mid and late game um tendencies and balancing and stuff like that and uh and it's typically a pretty big event the first week or two of the game is typically the most fun in my opinion uh that the game ever is because everyone's scraping for you know even like kind of crappy weapons and bad ammo and crappy armor and you know firefights tend to be kind of crazy because people aren't like completely decked out with the best gear or sometimes people will just leave like they won't fight because they are afraid they'll lose some you know item they have to have for a mission and so what happened was they installed a big update uh, this week, but it didn't have a wipe associated with it. And it wasn't this big update everyone's been expecting. Uh, and what's happening now is most people are thinking that update 14, which the current version is 13.1, is going to be the next wipe. And it will is maybe only about a month away. It's most people are still expecting them to wipe, you know, in the next month or two, mostly staying with that six month rotation of wipes. Uh, the last one happened in December. And so uh, that one's supposed to bring an update to, um, you know, Unity 2021, which is the engine it runs on. Uh, it's a uh, kind of an ancient engine. It's not exactly, you know, Unreal Engine 5. Uh, there's plenty to complain about with it, but it's what they dedicated to and, and there's no turning back. They they simply wouldn't be able to, uh, to, to do that. It would just be too much work to switch engines at this point, uh, even though, I would argue it would probably be a really good idea. Um, I think that 
they um, are also going to be trying to implement, um, you know, like a, yeah, either new maps or like expanded maps of, of the ones that they've already had. Uh, probably a bunch of new gear, new mechanics, new armor, new stuff like that. There's a bunch of systems and mechanics they, they're going to put in, I'm sure. It's just what everyone kind of hopes is that, yeah, sure, they can do that stuff, but hopefully they figure out like desync issues and they figure out, you know, things that matter to people when it comes to like PVP. And especially when you have the stakes that you have with a game like this, where if you die, you lose a ton of stuff and it can be a real bummer. And so um, this most recent patch that they did release this week actually did um, seemingly improve a lot of the, you know, desync and the way things feel with that. So uh, hopefully they can carry that into a big wipe and have a, a big event. So we'll see. So Tarkov players, are, our time is probably nearing for, uh, for something new. Next story is about Assassin's Creed Mirage. Uh, today they released a Master Assassin video and... Um, uh, Shinobi uh, on Twitter, who's a pretty prolific gaming commentator, kind of summed up the video like this. Um, it basically points out that in the game, you're going to start out as a thief with your ally Nihal. Um, you are playing as one of the characters. This is like a prequel, I believe, uh, to Valhalla. And in Valhalla, there are assassins in the game that you're kind of working with and learning from. And you're playing as one of them uh, in a younger time. Uh, you'll be raising, uh, you'll rise in the ranks of the Assassin's Creed, um, and you'll start off as an apprentice, and you have to do things to become a master. Um, they're bringing back outfit dies, so you'll be able to customize your cloak and uh, I'm sure some of your other items. Uh, the sword is the main weapon, but they're going to have an emphasis on tools, so like various little doodads you can uh, mess around with to. Uh, you, know, you know, distract enemies or kill enemies or, you know, trap people and things like that. And the most important thing, the thing that really got me excited is that progression is linear and it's story driven. It's not based on XP. I appreciate that some people love the Assassin's Creed, the newer games that are basically like like looter sorters, uh, you know, they aren't shooters, but they they basically have this idea of like I've, I've basically said that like uh, Valhalla and Odyssey are, are basically Ghost Recon Breakpoint, but with swords, um, at least in the gameplay and the loot system and stuff like that. And that rings true as far as I can tell. Now, um, yeah, uh, Mirage to me is, you know, it's supposed to be this return to old school Assassin's Creed. That's what it looks like it is so far. And this is really exciting to me. This is exactly what I wanted to see. So. Hopefully it comes true. Hopefully they uh, have done their homework here. I hope it does well because the idea is that they're still going to keep doing the big looter style games. But if Mirage does well, and if you didn't know before, Mirage is basically an expanded DLC. Uh, this was supposed to be a DLC for Valhalla, but they decided to turn it into a full fledged game instead. Uh, if it does well, they'll probably keep doing these more old school style games and i i hope they do because this is the only assassin's creed i'm excited to buy right now uh, the fourth story here is about red dead redemption and a possible remaster or even a remake uh, so the south korean rating board for uh, video games accidentally i guess released a, a a filing about red dead redemption not two and so the idea is that and the rumors are now which have been expanded on a little bit is that everyone's expecting a red dead redemption remaster or a full remake full remake seems a little unlikely to remake that game into like a red dead redemption 2 quality game considering how old red dead redemption is just seems unlikely to me i mean red dead redemption 2 if you play it on one of the new systems even without having like a next gen upgrade, I still think rivals most modern games, games that are coming out this year in fidelity and scope and detail and animation and voice acting and story and mechanics and all of that stuff. It's just, um, I, I think Red Dead Redemption 2 was the best game of the last gen. And I think you would, 
I would probably say it's the best one of this gen too if they really if they re-released it. Um, now that said, it the rumors the most recent things I saw was from Jeff Grubb, and uh, I guess he's hearing or supposedly it may not be a full remake, but it's about as close to one as it can be without being it. And so that we may be expecting a near Red Dead Redemption 2 level of quality with this, and that would be amazing. Some of the music moments in Red Dead Redemption 1, uh, just there's so many moments got the end, and it's just, it's very, very good. And uh, what would be really interesting is if they would even put in some really small connective tissue between two and the first game if you don't know the, the the second game is actually a prequel and so there's a character your main character that you play as and two does not appear in the first game and so i would really hope just to respect that character they would make some reference even small ones uh it would be really nice to to have that connection but we'll have to wait and see Okay, so I want to do a quick little discussion. Um, this is based on a uh, video or a, the games cast I saw from Kind of Funny today, uh, where they talked about what games are going to get left out of the Game of the Year discussion this year. Now, Game of the Year is a weird thing um, because even, and I'll admit I do this as well, people get like way too fixated on what outlets and individuals say are Game of the Year just because the Game Awards has a bunch of journalists vote and the game wins. It doesn't mean that that is the Game of the Year for everyone. It's probably the most comprehensive one that gets the most opinions. But it doesn't mean it has to be your game of the year. There's been plenty of things like like last year. It was the race between Elden Ring and God of War. And my game of the year was a Plague Tale Requiem. <laughs> and uh, you know, a few years ago, my game of the year was Haven. Uh, this like indie, low budget, kind of janky game that just touched me. And it was so good. And there were a few games that were ahead of it, right? So... The games that I think are most likely to miss out on the discussion this year because this year has has and will and will continue being one of the best gaming years ever, I think. Um, I think Hi-Fi Rush is going to miss out. I think that a lot of people will still manage to put it like in their discussion in their top 10 uh, or something. But I think Hi-Fi Rush coming out in January and being shadow dropped and just, I think, unfortunately, despite how good it is despite how amazing the story is despite how amazing the gameplay is despite the ridiculous graphics despite it's just everything about that game is amazing it's so good even i've kind of forgot i don't mention it I, i've forgotten it multiple times and that's a real bummer i wish that game would have come out in june because I wish it would have gotten like a five month campaign to advertise it. I wish that basically Redfall and Hi-Fi Rush would have switched places. I wish Redfall would have been shadow dropped. People would have been like, oh, wow, they shadow dropped it. That's weird. Oh, that's why they shadow dropped it. It's bad. Oh, well. Oh, what's this Hi-Fi Rush thing? They hype it up for three or four months and then we get to play it. And it has DLC come out just a few months later. And it's amazing. And I think that would have benefited that game a lot. I think it would have been much more in the discussion of game of the year. I think a few like niche uh, outlets will give Hi-Fi Rush game of the year. I think you'll see it get that award from somebody. Uh, but I just think that timing will really hurt that game. Uh, two games I think are going to miss out on most of the discussion is Resident Evil 4 and the Dead Space remakes. I think they're going to miss out on it partially because there's a lot of people who are iffy on whether or not remakes should even be considered. Um, and I think it's also going to miss out just because they hit, they splashed, they were both amazing. Uh, it seems like Resident Evil 4 people are more into that than Dead Space people were. But the overall feeling, in my opinion, is that they were both insanely good remakes and that they both were such significant remakes, literally from the ground up, that they probably should be considered, and this is my opinion, they probably should be in consideration for Game of the Year. Um, I only played Dead Space Remake, uh, just for full disclosure. I played the demo of Resident Evil 4. I definitely think they both deserve this chatter. They, they, Dead Space Remake is one of my favorite games of the year. It's probably gonna end up being like four or five for me. It is wildly good. It's so awesome. Um, the things that they change, the protagonist being voiced and uh, and things like that. 
amazing, but probably just not amazing enough. Uh, the, for the, the then I run into two games that aren't even out yet, but I think um, Spider-Man Two doesn't really get into that conversation. Um, I know people love the first game, but even the first game wasn't like a game of the year contender. It it's just Insomniac is is like is like hitting hot with like seven point five and eights. Like they aren't hitting, you know, their games aren't nines and tens. Even though I do think this first Spider-Man had a Metacritic score up near nine or around it. Um, I just don't, what I saw from that game is I think fanboys are going to say it's 10 out of 10. I think a lot of PlayStation fans are going to be really excited about it, but I think a lot of people are going to be like, it's just a really big DLC. And maybe it's not quite as like visually impressive as I would expect now that it's only quote unquote next gen or PS5. I, I mean, I know from what they've shown us so far, like it, like it doesn't look very good in my opinion i think the textures look bad i think the world looks kind of like it the world is very detailed for how big it is but on a smaller scale it, it just I don't, I don't think it looks that good maybe i'm just a hater you know I, I don't know i'm not gonna play it i mean it's not a game i'm interested in playing unless i can get my ps5 slim uh which uh you know i'll probably talk about another time when there's details more for sure um I just I think that it's going to come out and people are going to be like, wow, this is really great. But man, Tears of the Kingdom was amazing. Um, and, and so I think it will probably get left out of a lot of people's uh, top five or top tens. The final one is Baldur's Gate 3. And the reason I put that on is because this game really seems like in a lot of ways, it's going to be this like big, like triple A quality RPG you know, you know, they're claiming like 174 hours of recorded, um, you know, of like, um, like, you know, cut scenes and things like that. Uh, they're claiming it's like twice as many lines of dialogue than the whole Mass Effect trilogy had is only in Baldur's Gate 3. Um, and it looks great. It's a great looking game. Um, I am a little hesitant. I am going to play it. I've already, I've already purchased it. But it's a like an isometric turn based game, which is not my style. But I've seen enough people say that it's worth uh, it, it's probably still worth your time that I'm willing to check it out. But, it, but it's one of those games. I think you're going to look at it and, and it's going to be kind of like Spider-Man 2. It's going to have so many features of a game of the year. And if it came out in a 20, I was like 2019 or something that was kind of a dud or 2020, if it came out in a weaker year, it would probably be a contender. It's just not going to be this year, not against tears, not against Final Fantasy 16, not against Jedi Survivor, not against Starfield. It's just, you know, not against Diablo 4, not against Hi-Fi Rush. I won't forget it this time. Um, it, it, it just it, it's just bad timing probably but i think that game is going to do plenty well and the developers uh will, will be fine just like all of these games likely will do or have done the developers of these games are happy uh of course they would like a game of the year but i think these ones are going to miss it uh, the next story is a possible a play tale uh game uh, a third game uh, this is really exciting for me there was a story today uh, that you know someone had done some sleuthing on the hiring boards uh, for the studio that makes the game uh, a plague tale innocence and requiem and they are currently hiring for a plague tale game uh, and the reason this is interesting is because we are months past the release of this game now it's getting on you know getting probably close to you know not quite a year but getting there and if they were doing DLC, that probably wouldn't be something they'd be hiring for. They probably already have a big enough team to do DLC and they may be do, uh, doing DLC. We don't know yet, but there's a lot of implications here that people think this is probably for a next game. Um, and before the release of Requiem or maybe shortly after, even the people who made the game said like, you know, it, it, depending on how it's received, this could be the last game in this series. We may do something else, but if people really like it, then we'll, continue we'll make a third one uh, or, or that's you know the, the 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 summarized version of the interviews i saw and as far as i know it was received extremely well and again it was my game of the year requiem destroyed me it was fun to play the story was great the characters were amazing uh, it was heartbreaking it, it had moments of joy is a beautiful game. Um, it's the first game I've played uh, in this current gen at 30 FPS where it didn't bother me at all because it was so pretty, I didn't care. Um, 
there is a scene at the end of Requiem that very, very heavily insinuates what could happen in the next game. And I uh, talked about it in my review, uh, so you can go back and find that on my YouTube channel. Uh, but if they do what they hint to, it would be so cool. So I'd be all on board. I really hope this rumor is true. I would love a third Plague Tale game. EAFC's first release is coming on September 29th of this year. So uh, that got kind of accidentally released. Um, and the big notable thing about this is this is going to be the first release of EA's soccer or football franchise without the FIFA branding. Uh, if you have been paying attention to recent events, FIFA, uh, if you didn't know, is this like hyper really awful organization from top to bottom and one of the fun things they were doing was charging ea uh, i believe they were going to charge them one billion dollars for the rights to their name and what you need to realize is that if it was a billion dollars for the rights to all of the player likenesses and all of the branding and all of that then it would be worth it for sure but it isn't it's literally just for the rights of the fifa name and so while this may restrict uh, EAFC from having like a World Cup mode and stuff, because obviously FIFA isn't going to allow them to do that, uh, EA still, even when they had the FIFA branding, still had to go to all of the different leagues around the world, including the MLS, the Premier League, La Liga, you know, all of these leagues, and they had to get the rights individually and even from individual teams. And so the FIFA branding to tack them billion dollars onto all of that work and all that money uh, i i actually kind of applaud ea which is a thing not a lot of people will say these days i applaud them for being like you know what f you we're gonna do it without you and they're probably gonna be just fine uh, and and if you and the fun thing is that currently i believe there's four licensed games being developed for fifa and people are pretty much expecting them to all be just complete messes because there's just no chance that like like they're all with studios they're like mobile studios and nft and crypto studios and so it's probably going to be kind of rough but i think eafc is going to be just fine um i i am curious to how the change of branding affects things i highly doubt it'll be that big of a deal and um i hope they're successful because f fifa this is a real like who's worse situation <laughs> you you kind of don't want to root for either of them but i'll always root against fifa and in a very similar situation uh and i will wrap this into gaming uh twitter <laughs> has had an interesting week uh, and i will i, I want to talk about this because um, a big part of my content creation and my growth as a creator um, has been twitter and i'm one of the weirdos who i love twitter now I hated it for a long time, but about three-ish years ago, I stopped muting people and I stopped arguing with people who obviously had no desire to actually have a conversation. I just started banning people and, or, or uh, blocking them entirely. And you know what? It was a little rough. It wasn't super fun. I had to block some people who I at one time really liked, and it has made my Twitter experience mm, just perfect it's been great it really has been i ignore all the political stuff for the most part you'll see me pop off here and there uh, but i've gotten rid of all the toxic like division creators they can't see my stuff i've gotten rid of a lot of just people who just suck i've deleted them from my vision and it's made the twitter experience really great um but you know ever since the uh, electric car guy the rocket man uh, took over it's you know gotten pretty bad it's it, it, it's it, it, the thing that has really broken my back with Twitter. Um, you know, they had this rate limit thing recently where I'm pretty sure they broke something. Uh, Elon lied and said that they were testing a rate limit on how often you could view things. Uh, and then they fixed it and it's been normal ever since. So I think they just broke something and he lied, but we'll see. The thing that really broke my back with Twitter is that when they, they implemented this Twitter blue thing before he even bought it and it kind of was pointless. Uh, it didn't, uh, it didn't have like, they, they added like editable tweets eventually, even though the way the editing works is terrible. Um, it just wasn't very useful. I even tested it for a while before uh, the current owner took over and I, I deleted it. But the two things that ruined it for me 
and have made me want an alternative is making it so subscribed members have priority in their tweets being seen and especially the replies being seen. So if you look at a tweet now, say there's a tweet with a hundred comments on it or replies to it. Um, all of the um, people at Twitter blue will be boosted to the top. Even if they have zero replies, zero likes, if there's someone who, who's, they have like one follower, but they decide to pay the money, they'll be at the top of the, of the replies. And then if you're not subscribed, even if you have 5,000 likes and, you know, 50 replies and it's just, you know, where it should be the top reply, it won't be, it'll be below all the people who paid. And, um, and how that's played out for me has been, um, before they implemented that change, I averaged a quarter million to half a million interactions per month on Twitter. Uh, and that, you know, helped drive listenership on this podcast, viewership on my YouTube videos. Um, you know, it, it mattered, right. And what happens, um, is, is I've noticed it's gone down to about a hundred thousand per month now, uh, which sounds like a lot. It really isn't. It actually isn't many at all. And because even my half, even my quarter mil half mil wasn't really that much. And, um, it's made it where it's made it almost feel pointless to, to keep using it. Um, I, you know, my, my, uh, follower count has been stagnant ever since. Um, I'm just not willing to one pay for Twitter blue, and I'm just not willing to do or say the things you have to do to get attention, especially if you're not being helped by the algorithm. The other thing that really irked me is that they turned the verification into just a pay and play thing. And so literally anyone can be verified and they removed it from like notable people. And so, you know, the, the Twitter check Mark, uh, for its ups and downs, you know, who deserved it or not for the most part, you knew if they had the check mark, they were someone of some significance for better or worse. And he got rid of that. And what's so weird to me is that it's part of the Twitter blue. So you pay and you get a check mark, but the, but the whole reason you wanted a check mark was to be thought of as notable in some capacity, but now it's actually the opposite. If someone has a check mark and they aren't part of a brand, you just assume there's some weirdo with 10 followers, uh, and a follow botted account, uh, who spews a bunch of crap, you know? And so that's just really killed it for me. And, and I'm still on it. I'll be on it probably till it falls into the ocean. Um, but you know, they've had competitors and over the years, I know last year, um, an, an app called hive, uh, kind of tried to be that app. And I actually really liked hive. The issue was when they kind of caught their popularity, when Twitter did something stupid that I think they had two devs and you're talking about a field, uh, you know, in Twitter that has thousands of employees, uh, you know, and, and they just couldn't scale and they, uh, they couldn't do like their API had had issues and their privacy, you know, they, they, they were a small company. They weren't ready for that attention and they, and they flubbed it. And there's been a bunch of others. There's Mastodon, which is this like really overcomplicated kind of pretentious one, in my opinion. Uh, and then blue sky kind of looked like it was going to be this thing. It was, uh, Jack, who's one of the co-founders of Twitter, uh, is associated with it. And for a while people were like, Ooh, blue sky could be interesting because it's got Jack involved. He's, he was the good guy. Right. Um, and then blue sky started sending out beta invites and people were kind of into it. Um, for me, what kind of ruined it is that one, they're still just doing it by invite. And so, you know, you have to know someone to get on it. Um, they, they've actually had to stop people from even using private invites because their servers couldn't handle the influx, which is not a great sign. And then Jack has turned into a figure that I think is no less problematic than the Twitter owner. And so, you know, he's been spewing a bunch of weird conspiracy theories and he pushes crypto and NFTs real hard. And, um, he's supporting a presidential candidate. That's a complete whack job. And like, so he, in my opinion, blue sky has been ruined one, because I think that they've handled their situation really badly by not getting things going fast enough, kind of like hive. And two, I think their association with Jack, where he's not like the owner, he's like on their board or something. And they're using him obviously as a marketing thing to be, Hey, look, Jack's involved. But I think at least to me, 
uh, it's kind of turned me off. And I think honestly, the type of people who are into Twitter, who like Twitter blue and like the owner and stuff like that are the people who are probably the most excited about blue sky. And that's just gonna, you know, it's just gonna cannibalize itself. Right. So then there's rumors of Instagram and Facebook, uh, having their own. And then this week they released it. It's called threads. Um, look, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, I would actually argue that he's not as bad as the Twitter owner, uh, or even as Jack. Um, I think Mark Zuckerberg is someone who, um, is hyper focused on making his company profitable and making money. Um, but I have seen him say or do very few things that come off as outright evil or, you know, in that vein and, and hateful and just all of that, where I think the owner of Twitter and I think that, you know, even some others to some capacity are like hateful people. And, you know, Twitter really is like a haven for undesirable people. And, and it's like that, that's like it's shtick now, and I, or at least that's what the owner is trying to make it. And it's pushing out people who don't want to be associated with that, at least in my opinion, or at least in my case. So I, I really think that Threads is interesting. I, I really like the app. Um, I really like the look of it. It's very simple. They are going to be adding more stuff, but it's had a really good launch. As of today, earlier today, they already had 75 million signups. That's only a couple days. Um, it was easy to get into it because it uses your Instagram account. Uh, and that's probably why they have so many signups so quickly. It, uh, I assume they'll have a hundred million, if not more by the end of the weekend. Um, it, it, in some ways it is picking between two evils. Uh, the, the app has issues with privacy concerns. Uh, it's not even allowed in Europe yet, which means it's had all of these downloads and it's not even allowed to be downloaded in Europe uh, because they have issues with some of the privacy stuff that I assume will get figured out. Like they'll get their own version or something. I don't know. But uh, what's most interesting about it is that it really seems like it's threads and Twitter now. And Twitter still has the lead, still has the mind share for now. And what's going to happen is they Twitter is going to have to be agile and smart. And the problem is, is that they've been agile in some ways, but they haven't been very smart. And what's going to be interesting to see is if they are able to say, okay, like someone at the company is going to have to say, okay, owner, just, we need to do some business. Now we have an actual competitor. They're doing really good. They're getting a bunch of good press and, and half of the reason people like it is because they aren't us. So we need to make some drastic decisions to reverse some things, to, to put some things back the way they were, that people liked them. We, we have to do something to try to win people back. We can't keep going down the path we're going down. Uh, and it's going to be up to that owner and whether or not he's cool, whether he's going to be willing to do that. And all signs so far will point that he won't be, that he'll double down. He'll keep going the direction he's going to the point where some people just think he straight up wants it to fail, uh, whether there's some kind of bankruptcy uh, things that they can do or whatever. I don't know. Um, but I'll be really curious because I suspect that Threads is going to um, you know, add these things that are missing really quickly. I think they're going to add a desktop component. I think they're going to get uh, able to be downloaded in Europe pretty quickly. I think they're going to add a bunch of these things people are already asking for so fast that Twitter's going to have to figure it out quick if they want to stave them off. And I don't have faith in the Twitter I've seen uh, over the last you know, few months or year. Um, I have no faith that they can do that. Uh, I don't think he'll let them. So we'll have to wait and see. The final story here is that we have some content updates. Uh, we, I have finally hit 2000 subs on YouTube, uh, five years in the making. A lot of people do that in their first couple months. Uh, you know, to be fair, I've only really been trying for the last year ish, uh, but it's exciting. I've basically doubled my sub count. My videos have gone from getting like 25 views a video, uh, to, you know, averaging at least about 250, about 250, uh, even up to getting 500 or a couple thousand on a few rare occasions. 
super exciting really really cool um very excited about how things are going and um yeah it's great um i did post a video on youtube kind of talking about all of the things going on with the stream and the podcast and uh, youtube and all of that so please check that out if you want my lengthy thoughts uh, but long story short i'm only gonna keep working harder uh, i have more goals I, i'm about to reach my goal to get partnered on youtube uh, only a little past halfway through the year so that's really exciting that was a big goal for me this year and it looks like it's going to happen pretty soon and uh, we'll have to work on some new goals so please be sure to check out that video if you can over on my youtube it's just at bond diesel and uh we'll uh we'll keep doing this together so i appreciate it we're gonna hit some listener questions now. If you have your own question, be sure to check out the Google form questionnaire that's on Discord and in my uh, Twitter at the EchoCast. Uh, you can ask in my Discord. The link for that is in the description of the video or the podcast. Uh, you can ask in the YouTube comments, or you can even hit me up on Twitter at Bond Diesel or at the EchoCast. The first question this week comes from YouTube's. They say, uh, you mentioned in Discord, um, with Mass Effect, uh, the next game. It's why I sort of hope they use the next game as a chance to fix a lot of issues with the lore, even if it means they retcon some stuff uh, some of us like. Uh, could you share your top three or so issues in the lore that are fixed in the next game? So there's some that I don't think are realistic. Like I still think that the timeline, that it's only been like 30 years or something since uh, we all discovered each other. Um, I, I, I've always found that to be kind of silly. It seems like way too short of a time span for humans to go from not knowing there's alien life in the galaxy to being like fully integrated and all of that. I, I, I've always found that to, that timeline to be a little short. I've even honestly found the 50,000 year Reaper timeline to be kind of short. Now, there is reason to believe that that 50,000 years might have only been the Prothean uh, cycle, that maybe there had been other cycles that were millions of years. That, you know, the Reapers had to wait longer for civilizations to reach their, tech, uh, reach their technological peak. Um, some of that I would like to see kind of retconned and figured out. I would like for them to maybe try to figure out and, and maybe clear up the whole Cory and Geth conflict and what really happened during the morning war. And, uh, you know, there's some recollections from an old book that like the Geth wiped out like 99.9% .9 of the Corians during the morning war, which goes completely against their whole, like, we only fought to defend ourselves thing. Like, you know, there's things like that. Um, just the, how unreal is like, how like confusing the whole, like, Krogan reproduction thing is and that like if they truly reproduce as fast as some of the figures are they would literally have like billions of Krogan within like a couple like it just even as powerful and as much of a nuisance as they sound like they were which led to the genophage it still seems like it just wouldn't have been possible to hold them off like they, they should have been able to have such large numbers that even the genophage wouldn't have like helped they, they shouldn't have been able to do it um i i, I think things like uh the I, I and i know they kind of explained it throughout the trilogy but the whole thing with gosh the 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 ammo how in the first game everything's rechargeable and then it goes to you know clips after that I know they explain it in the game. It still just doesn't sit right with me. I think there's the whole Andromeda thing is I think the most likely thing that they will fix via retcon will be the Andromeda, the whole involvement of the Andromeda mission and the fact that just somehow throughout the trilogy, we wouldn't have heard about this at all, even with Liara as the shadow broker. Um, with a bunch of high ranking alliance and other species military people being involved with them building at least one of the arcs on the other side of the moon and the soul system. Uh, like it just so much of it doesn't make any sense. It just almost makes no sense at all. Um, and, and that they, that we never even get a mention. So I'm hoping that they do something to kind of retcon or, or, or make the involvement of Andromeda make sense. Like, Oh, that's why we never heard about them. Or we'll just pretend like we were talking about them. I don't know. So those probably aren't the best answers, but those are the ones I can come up with off the top of my head. Master Prime has a few questions here that I will hit really quickly. 
uh, what modern trend in gaming would you like to see become a standard uh, accessibility um, i think we're going to see some issues with games that have been in development for a really long time starfield being the main one that we're going to see that they are pretty far behind on the accessibility game it kind of seems like they may only have things as simple as like big captions and maybe like some color blindness modes uh, but there's going to be a bunch of stuff missing that when they started development of that game it just wasn't typical to add all of these accessibility options and with the way that their games work it may be difficult to do a lot of those things um i think that's a big one to to make this game you know, make these games playable for almost anyone and uh, no, no matter their disability um i think that's pretty cool it's cool seeing more people gain access to these games second question are you going to play the cyberpunk 2077 expansion absolutely 100 i will i'm really excited about it if all these rumors of this expansion basically read in, in a way reinvigorating the entire game experience and that it may be worth doing a whole nother playthrough um yes i'm excited for that i think that uh would be really cool it sounds like this expansion is awesome on its own and it may even open up some alternative endings than the ones that were included with the base game uh yeah i definitely hope to play it and the final question how many delays would you bear for the next mass effect and this had an lol at the end uh, this is a really very realistic prospect. If you've listened to my recent Mass Effect videos, I talk about how we're at a point where I think 2026 is probably early for the next Mass Effect game. Um, I wouldn't be surprised at all if it comes in 2027 or heaven forbid 2028, uh, which is really crazy because if we hit 2028, then we're like absolutely looking at getting close to like the next gen of consoles. Um, so we'll see, but I'll I'll bear with anything. I I, I, I they they will have at least me. They they will at least have me for for one go. And I think um, I I really I think they'll do a good job. I, I'm I'm pretty confident that they're gonna treat this right for one way or the other. But that next Mass Effect game may be further away than anyone wants to admit. Awesome questions. Thank you for them. Again, be sure to, uh, you know, hit up any of my socials and stuff like that with your questions for next week. And that's uh, that's it. So thank you so much for listening. Uh, I'm really happy to get feedback. This is a solo podcast. So uh, the the other part of this conversation is you. So, you know, hit me up in the YouTube comments, hit me up on the Discord, get your questions in on my Google form that you can find in the Discord or on the at the EchoCast Twitter account. You can find the link for it there. Um, I, I want to hear from you. Feedback, questions, topics, whatever. Let me have it. Uh, you can find me all over the internet, including on Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and on Twitch, and on threads as Bon underscore Diesel. For some reason, Bon Diesel is like a, a no-no word with Instagram and Facebook. I don't understand why, but there we are. That's all I have for this one. So until next time.